This audiobook is a member of the Witness to History series. It is entitled The Tragic Truth About the FDR Era, Volume A, FDR's Rise to the Presidency. It was recorded on February 11, 1976, by Colonel Curtis B. Dow and Dr. Peter Beter. Colonel Dow shares with Dr. Beter and with you rare and often stunning personal close-ups of the personality, family, and presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was Colonel Dow's father-in-law. He also draws upon the lessons of a remarkable business career, ranging from the top echelons of Wall Street, where, for example, he was once a partner in the firm known today as Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, to the founding of what is today one of America's best-known major companies. His accomplishments are rendered even more amazing by the fact that he served a total of more than 13 years in voluntary military service, leading to the rank he now holds in the retired Air Force Reserve. He is also the author of several books, including FDR, My Exploited Father-in-Law, and Warlords of Washington, and is well known for his patriotic activities for which he has been honored with a number of awards. He is joined in this discussion by Dr. Peter Beter, who is no stranger to audiobook listeners. Dr. Beter has recorded four previous audiobook talking tapes and is heard monthly throughout the United States and in several foreign countries by means of his, of his unique monthly audio letter. He is widely known as the man who opened Fort Knox in 1974, as well as for his numerous advanced revelations of major economic and political developments based on confidential information sources in intelligence, business, and finance. He is listed in Who's Who in the East and other biographical reference works and has written several books, including the nonfiction bestseller, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published by George Braziller in 1973. Colonel Dow, it's indeed an honor to be here with you today to discuss one of the most important topics in the history of the United States, the role of your father-in-law, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his impact on the present as well as the past and future course of our nation. In our discussion today, February 11, 1976, I believe uh, our listeners should be given a personal evaluation of the significance of the Roosevelt era. And as you know, it has been e virtually impossible to have this evaluation because the data has been carefully hidden in family records and hasn't been uh, made available for the general public. Since you were a part of this Roosevelt Delano family, uh, we are indeed privileged uh, to be able to record today an oral history of a very important part of the history of our nation. Now, Dr. Beter, I appreciate very much the opportunity of exchanging ideas on very important topics with you. I am flattered that you want to ask my personal opinions most of which I have never discussed before with the public. But I feel that in our challenging days which are upon us here, it is important for the American people to understand some of the problems which they have not effectively understood or solved in the past. And I am very delighted to have this opportunity to exchange ideas with you this afternoon. Well, thank you very much, Colonel. I know there are those apologists uh, of the New Deal who will ask, uh, why bring up the New Deal at this time? After all, it's been dead for so many years. But the point is, it's not dead. We are about to see it resurrected by Nelson Rockefeller, one of the original key New Dealers, and uh, only he will call it by another name very shortly, uh, the New Balance or some sort of euphemistic name. Uh, on the topic of FDR, uh, the American public uh, falls into two large groups. Uh, there are those who consider him a hero, a savior, if you please, and then there are those who strongly uh, dislike him uh, as being deceptive, uh, treacherous, uh, dishonest, and serving his own personal interests. I think that the best way to, we can begin is to ask, uh, how did you first uh, come to know FDR? Uh, Dr. Beter, 
I first heard about FDR in an article at which time he was running for vice president with uh, Mr. Cox as president on the Democratic ticket in 1920. And I recall seeing a picture of him standing there with a rifle in his hand. For what purpose, I do not know, because he had a stiff collar on and a stick pin in his tie. And I couldn't figure out, but somebody said, well, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, you've got to get some sort of a gimmick to make you a little folksy. That's the first time I ever even heard of his name, but I got to know him later on, as I will develop with you in due yeah. course. But well, then getting to, uh, uh, to the lady that you married, Anna, the daughter, uh, when did you first meet her, Colonel? Well, uh, Dr. Beter, I met Anna at a dinner party at the home of friends of mine, Mr. and Mrs. Walter Douglas, in their Fifth Avenue home in New York in 1924, around Christmas time, before a, a dance. And uh, Anna and Kay Douglas, the daughter of Walter Douglas, who was then the president of the Southern Pacific Railway, uh, they were classmates or schoolmates at Miss Chapin's school. And at the dance, I um, enjoyed later on, and uh, one thing led to another, and then I was invited to a house party at Anna's grandmother's, Mrs. James Roosevelt's home in Hyde Park, and uh, we had a very nice weekend up there, and uh, several months later, we became engaged, and uh, that June we were, following June, we were married well, at Hyde Park. But had you not met uh, FDR uh, before that? No, I had not, Dr. Beter. I see, and... Uh, uh, I met him up there at his mother's home when he came to dinner in a wheelchair. I was rather touched by his appearance because his eyes were wistful and uh, he had to be wheeled in by an, an attendant. He joined in the conversation and uh, I immediately became um, attached to him and uh, I was quite touched by his uh, courage in trying to overcome his uh, disability. When I went to see him about a couple of months later at his office in the Fidelity Deposit Company for luncheon, uh, I was impressed with all the naval pictures that he had around his desk, and he had our luncheon brought in on the tray by a waiter, and we discussed uh, World War I, and I told him that I had been a very unimportant uh, ensign in the um, naval aviation forces overseas, but I had volunteered, and uh, he asked me a lot of questions because I had served under an old friend of his, Zachary Linesdown, who was then a commander at the forces at Gipavar, and I had served uh, prior to the armistice with the Royal Naval Forces at Howden, East Yorkshire, uh, in their balloon um, forces. We had a patrol in the North Sea. And um, he asked me a lot of questions, and uh, we got along fine. Do you recall, uh, Colonel, uh, some of the questions that uh, uh, FDR asked you at that time? Well, not very many, uh, Dr. Beter. It was largely, a, a, uh, shall I say, small talk about his going overseas at that time um, with uh, Woodrow Wilson and the George Washington and, uh, and um, the peace conference at Versailles. And he asked me uh, if I'd seen Commander Lansdowne recently, and I said no, I hadn't. And unfortunately, the commander was burned up in that terrible accident at the Shenandoah. Did he ever work in Wall Street, Colonel? Well, Wall Street, Dr. Beter, is a general term. He was uh, a vice president of the Fidelity Deposit Company, which is the big uh, casualty insurance company with its main office in Baltimore, Maryland. And he was, uh, uh, from a titular point of view, he was in charge of their New York office. But due to his physical condition, he only went there occasionally, but his name was very valuable in the bonding business. And he used to go down to Wall Street occasionally, I would say, but prior to his um, getting the um, attack of infantile paralysis that that happened, he uh, used to go down there, and uh, he was uh, interested in law more than finance, but he became involved in several deals down there, and several of which I didn't think very much of. Did, was he a good uh, stock man or a good, good stock? You no, know? I would say absolutely not. FDR's knowledge on money was very limited, very limited indeed. But oh. he, but he had um, he had a good law background, and uh, 
I presume that um, he could write a pretty good legal paper, although I think he's sloughed off most of this to his partners. Uh, as I understand it, he, he didn't like law. He liked to create law, work on law and create it, but or never perhaps, follow the law. Or perhaps manufacture his own law in political areas if the case warranted it. Because later on, when he did become president, he uh, was always very happy when he signed legislation. Uh, he said to the effect, now I'm creating law. That's right. I think he remembered um, the uh, the maxim that we could apply to Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi. Uh, translating, Colonel, meaning uh, the state is me. That's right. It's, a, it's an exaggerated form of egotism. Uh, are you saying that uh, FDR was an egotist? Extremely so, Dr. Beter. I see. Now, uh, I, I noticed that you bowed out of the family in the summer of 1933. Can you tell us why that was? Well, that's um, a lot of things happened, Dr. Beter, between 1924 and 1933. Uh, historically, politically, economically in this country, you remember that we had the initiation of an enormous panic in the fall of 1929, where a lot of us in Wall Street lost a great deal of money. And we had the political rise at the same time, coincidentally, with the rise of FDR at that time, at the suggestion of Al Smith and some of his associates to have him run for governor, which he did and was elected. And from that time on, his star as a political figure rose. And my situation in Wall Street were ref were reflected the... Uh, devastation and the decline and the panic prices uh, that the panic wrought upon us, which is duly um, inflicted upon us by international interests. So when uh, FDR m moved on down to Washington, why uh, things changed and some of his associates, very high associates and friends like uh, Louis McHenry Howe and uh, Felix Frankfurter, who didn't particularly like me, why uh, it caused a, pass, uh, a, a parting of the ways and the uh, Unfortunate, I think, that the situation occurred because I did not go along with some of the things that I saw in the White House at very close range. Uh, so then, uh, after that, you only came back to the White House on weekends. That's about right. I was very busy in Wall Street uh, during the week, and I'd run down to Washington to see my two children, Sister and Buzz, and visit with friends and talk to the president occasionally, and uh, you know what... Uh, then I'd go back to New York on Sunday night. Right. And in June 1933, uh, I think you got your divorce, or at least... Uh... Well, Anna went to Reno in June and, uh, of 33, and uh, with Katie and Sister and Buzz, I went up to visit my very good old friends, Willis Wilmot and his mother and father at Plum Lake, Wisconsin. We were up there for about six weeks. And in the meantime, I recall that... Uh, I felt I should like to have a pistol permit because it's a kind of rough country, and the late J. Edgar Hoover personally gave me a pistol permit. But Charlie Rich went along with him, with, with us at that time, and he was a member of the FBI that helped me out too, just in case. Uh, uh, what is your present situation so far as your marriage and your children? And I know that you're a grandfather, and uh, you do have children from... Uh, Anna Roosevelt, uh, what is that situation today? Well, Sister and Buzz, of course, have grown up and out in the wide world, and after Anna and I parted company very gently, uh, about six years later, I married Catherine Miller Lees of Haverford, Pennsylvania, and we have four children, and we have four grandchildren, which I'm very proud of, and we see them occasionally here, or not as often as we would like. Uh, going back to our earlier conversations, uh, Colonel, uh, can you tell us uh, about the time when you bowed out uh, as a member of the family? Could you expound more on that? Well, I think I know what you're driving at, Dr. Beter. Yes, I always maintain very friendly relationship with FDR and he with me for very valid reasons. We were always good friends, although I did not agree with a, a number of his political uh, observations and uh, leanings. But I will say this, that his mother thought very well of me, and I was still one of the, her three trustees, along with his uncle, Mr. Frederick A. Delano, and himself. And so we had reasons to be close friends, but I was 
so shocked that I can hardly describe it when I found out later on of his role in bringing on World War II and the Pearl Harbor attack. That was really devastating to me. Did you get any hint of any change in the character uh, of uh, FDR? Oh, I think that's a very interesting question. Yes, I certainly did, because uh, he was a, a certain type of individual. He's ambitious to do something better. But when he did arrive at that point, and you must remember that he was crippled, he, he became, he became uh, difficult in this respect. He was not only ambitious, very vain, but he was completely handled on important things of international monetary matters and important social matters by his advisors. So actually, he was a perfect foil for them, and that was very dismaying to me, having known him in brighter years, brighter former years. Did they uh, try to build him up and say, uh, uh, we, you should be the president of the world, if I may say? I think that idea was thrown out to him that if he did thus and so, if he created another war and they got into an international situation, he was a logical man, certainly not Winston Churchill or anybody in Europe. He was a logical man to be the first president of the world, and I think that flattered his vanity. Colonel, I can't help but feel that uh, we have an, another scenario here uh, in uh, Woodrow Wilson in that uh, they were telling Wilson, too, in, this, in those days, uh, that he was going to be the great white father on the great white horse to save the world. Uh, you remember those uh, principles? Yes, I sure do. I think that's a good point. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the tool of the international bankers and the international ideologists, and so was FDR. There was a great deal of similarity between the two of them. Of course, the internationalists had made a great deal of money from the period of World War I, out of World War I, up into World War II, so it was a very much more serious situation and more valuable to them when FDR was put into the White House by them. I see another link from Woodrow Wilson uh, to President uh, Roosevelt and to uh, Nelson Rockefeller when he becomes president, if he does become president under his scenario. And if he does become president under his new balance, we've had the we've had the New Deal, the Fair Deal. Now we're going to have the New Balance, and I understand he's going to start uh, really campaigning on uh, February the 19th at a, uh, opening a gun here in Washington, the National Press Club, and he's going to speak on some very controversial subjects. It seems like now that uh, uh, the member of this international tribe is now going to. Uh, uh, come forth. This is their third attempt. This is their third time at bat. And if he makes a home run, it seems to me that the American people are out. Are uh, what? Are out. That is, the American people are going to suffer. Uh, they are now going to get their uh, merging of American life into that of the Soviet Union. Now, uh, I'm trying to set the stage here, Colonel, uh, very quickly so that we can go into more substance later on, as if we haven't had enough substance so far, we have. Uh, we uh, want to get your opinions on, really, the things that took place during this period. It's a very important period, and also to pierce the veil uh, that many of the American people have not been able to do for so many years because you were an intimate part of this uh, uh, family. And uh, speaking of the family again, could you tell us a little bit about, about Eleanor uh, Roosevelt, who you refer to in your book uh, as Mama? Yeah, as Mama, I called her. And uh, she was a very interesting, colorful lady, as you well know. At the time when I first knew her, though, she was very quiet. And she, um, she was in the background lodge at our mother-in-law's house at Hyde Park. But she was a very gracious hostess and helped uh, her mother-in-law and, and her husband. Uh, she wanted him to retain his political status at that time and uh, maintain his many friends, whereas his mother, uh, Mrs. James Roosevelt, who I will in the future refer to in this interview as Granny, 
She wanted uh, her son to take it easy and retire and lead the life of, uh, of a country gentleman in his semi-crippled condition. She had a very old, fine old uh, Hudson River estate there, and her house had been remodeled. And they had a very large, great room added on one end, which is very colorful, full of books and a very big fireplace. And uh, FDR had a desk to the left of that fireplace, which was the desk, I believe, that Wilson used uh, on the George Washington when he went abroad. I can remember one time when we were talking there, and we were looking at this picture over that hung over the fireplace there. It was a picture of Isaac Roosevelt. And uh, he was in semi-colonial um, garb, very interesting, and I was looking at it, and he was looking at it, too. And he says, Kurt, you know, um, that old boy was a pretty sharp tack. And I said, yes, I guess he was. He said, if you and I were to do any business with him, he certainly ought to have kept our overcoats and our coats buttoned. <laughs> and he laughed, and, and I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good joke about it, one of his ancestors. Uh, were there any uh, close uh, neighbors of importance around Granny's uh, estate, Colonel? Well, I say, um, Dr. Beater, that she was surrounded by very important neighbors. Uh, in particular, I can refer to the Archibald Rogers. Uh, Mr. Rogers was one of the original members of the Standard Oil Group, and he gave many a, a fine New Year's Eve party. I attended several, and we used to play hockey on his ice pond. When you lived uh, near the estate of Pocantico Hills, where the Rockefellers lived, uh, did you ever have occasion to see Nelson Rockefeller? Oh, yes, we were good friends, and we were friends of his family there, and occasionally I would go over there and play tennis with him. And I recall one time when uh, we were playing tennis, and then we were invited, Anna and I were invited for dinner at his grandfather's house. And that was, uh, were about uh, 14 people, as I remember it. And uh, his grandfather was a most interesting gentleman. He was in up in years, but he had a most uh, alert look his eyes had a very piercing look and he was extremely bright i would say for some reason or other i don't know but i was sitting on his right during the dinner and at the close of the dinner we played a, a little game which was the mr rockefeller's favorite game called numerica that's an unusual name could you tell us about that name a game and it was a very very simple little numbers game something like bingo and um at the conclusion of the uh, of the game, the butler came in and carried out the little cards, and I turned to Mr. Rockefeller and said, Mr. Rockefeller, this is a, a very, very interesting game, very interesting indeed. He smiled at me and he cleared his throat, <clears throat> sort of like that, and everybody, of course, stopped talking. <laughs> and down on the other end of the table was his housekeeper, Mrs. Evans, a very attractive lady, up in years, but she looked after the old gentleman. And he cleared his throat, so everybody stopped talking, and he said, Yes, Mr. Dow, New America is a very, very interesting and very fine game. The fine points of which I learned as a small boy at the knee of Mrs. E Evans. <laughs> and everybody roared with laughter because that made her out to be about 150 years old. <laughs> it was a very interesting dinner, I can assure you that. <laughs> Uh, getting back to the political phase, Colonel, uh, can you tell us uh, when uh, FDR began to uh, get back into the political arena? I would say that about 1927, Dr. Beter, he, uh, his health was improving in respect to his, the movement of his legs, and his wife was very active in um, helping him rebuild his fences politically, and Al Smith came into the picture, and... Uh, Together with Al Smith and some of his friends, why, he not only helped Al Smith, but in turn Al Smith helped him. And I would say that's where the political star on FDR began to arise about 1927 to 28, and then FDR was finally elected governor of New York State. Did Granny and Eleanor, his wife, have any uh, part of this? Well, his wife did, but Granny didn't uh, enter into it very much, except that she entertained some of the many people that came there at her house. And sometimes she was a little upset when there'd be 20 people for dinner, and she didn't know anything except there was going to be six. So did she take to politics as such? Or no, she, she wasn't particularly fond of politics, but, uh, but her daughter-in-law, Eleanor Roosevelt, was, and she was a very gracious and very, very real help to FDR at that time. Uh, you once told me a story about Al Smith and his platoon. Would you share it with our listeners? 
<laughs> Dr. Beta, that's a funny story, really, in serious politics. Al Smith was coming from Albany on his way to New York, and Al was governor at that time. And he was stopped off to see Franklin uh, for luncheon at, uh, at Granny's house at Hyde Park on the way to New York. And Al Smith used to chew a cigar down to the button. He'd uh, use a spittoon a lot, and when they, Granny didn't have a spittoon, a big brass spittoon in her big living room. So the problem came as, what are we going to do when Al Smith gets down to the end of his cigar? Well, Tom Lynch, who was quite a politician in Poughkeepsie, solved the problem, and he came up with a very bright, shiny spittoon there, and that solved and saved the day, so Al Smith and nobody else was embarrassed. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Colonel, uh, what was it like uh, to be around FDR during the days when he was governor in Albany, New York? Well, Dr. Peter, I only, only went up there occasionally because we had plenty going on in Wall Street. We were at the bottom of a depression there. But the executive house in those days at Albany was very grim and very gloom, gloomy. Um, FDR had to have a special elevator put, put in there so he could get up and down. And I never particularly enjoyed going up to Albany on account of those circumstances. I see, but... Uh what was the atmosphere around there during the days of the stock market crash? Where in Wall Street? No, there at Albany. Well, they didn't reflect that very much. So they were largely engrossed in the, the political aspects of the situation. Do you think that the plans were laid uh, during that time for President uh, Roosevelt to become president? A little bit later on, I would say, now, this is a guess, I would say about 1929 uh, and 30. I think at that time, uh, some of the important people in New York began to feel that FDR was a potential candidate, and I further feel that he went along with some of their major objectives, and I mentioned people like um, uh, Raskob, John Raskob, Al Smith, Bernard Baruch, Felix Frankfurter, Joe Kennedy, and others. I was on the floor of the stock exchange at that time. And uh-huh. he, uh, not only on Wall Street, I was right in the middle of it. What firm were you with then? I was with uh, a New York firm of O'Brien, Potter, and Stafford, of which I was a managing partner as I had left Lehman Brothers with their blessing about a year before. It was a very poor time to leave, but I, I made that move in 1929, which is a very expensive one for me. But I was a member of the New York Stock Exchange at that time and on the floor October the 24th, the day of the big crash. I have been alerting my listeners that the same thing has been happening uh, recently uh, to the stock market as I uh, in 1929. Could you expound uh, uh, more fully on the uh, the stock market. Do you see any uh, similarities today uh, with that of yesterday? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer, Dr. Beter, accurately. Let me refer to my views of what happened in 1929. We had gone through a great period of expansion, a deliberate expansion, and then the big international world powers decided that it was time to cut their melon. And so they withdrew credit very suddenly in Wall Street in October. And uh, on October 29th, brokers' loans went up very much, and credit was withdrawn. Gold was shipped out of the country prior thereto. And therefore, it was a credit panic, and stock prices plummeted. There were many suicides. It was a very difficult, very difficult, dangerous time. I remember that w- that Winston Churchill came over here and appeared on the balcony in the stock exchange to see the turmoil. But obviously, he must have had some pre-knowledge of this situation because he was a very close friend of Bernard Baruch, who knew the score. And I remember him being appearing in the balcony, and nobody paid any attention to them because they were wondering whether they were alive or dead financially. Weren't there some false starts and false beginnings? There was a false beginning, Dr. Beter, about the middle of September, but that was merely the testing out of the market. Just like today, the market is being tested in a highly political market today, but in those days it was, it was manipulated, to my knowledge, by the international powers. Now, whether they're doing that today on a super, 
on a super type of operation, I don't know, but it certainly looks that way. It looks that way because there's a very real drive to put us into a internationally controlled one world government, which the American people certainly do not want to be put into, but they are highly unalerted to the danger. Uh, getting back to the political picture, uh, how about the Chicago Convention? Uh, did you attend that? Yes, I attended that as a volunteer. Louis Howe didn't want me to go out there at all because he thought I'd mess things up. But I assured him that I wouldn't open my mouth politically but just go there as a loyal supporter of my then father-in-law. I went out there on my own and I had a very amusing experience there. Could you tell us about it? Uh, well, Dr. Beter, um, I didn't know anything about politics in those days, not that I know much about it now, but at the same time I was out there and an old friend of mine named Tom K. Smith from St. Louis uh, was with the Prendergast group and they were pushing their Missouri candidate. And I said, Tom, what are you doing up here? And he said, oh, I'm up here just trying to push for uh, Senator Rankin. I said, well, you're wasting your time. Me bluffing 100%, but just uh, talking out of the corner of my mouth. Oh, he said, no. He said, no. He said, we got to do that. And he said, I got to go to a meeting down there in a hotel right now. I'll see you later. So I said, where are you going? And he mentioned the name of a hotel nearby, and I decided I'd go up there, too. He said, no, don't you come over here, Curtis. This is dangerous. No, I said, I'm coming over there. I have a message from Mr. Prendergast. And uh, so I went over there. Uh, I got in the cab. And, uh, in five minutes, I was there. I walked down the hall there, and there was a fellow standing out in front of this big door there, loaded with hardware. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to speak to Mr. Prendergast. He said, what do you want to speak to him about? I said, that's my business. So he opened the door, and pretty soon Mr. Candid Mr. Prendergast poked his head. I said, what do you want, young man? I said, Mr. Prendergast, I'm with the Roosevelt delegation. And if you really want to get on the bandwagon early, you better get on the Roosevelt bandwagon right away. He said, when I need your advice, young man, I will let you know. And the door slammed in my face, and the guard thumbed in my direction, and I moved away and went back to the hotel. Uh, and talking about Pendergast always brings to mind, Colonel, the name of Harry Truman. Do you think that he was in that room, too? I couldn't. I couldn't sign an affidavit to that effect, but I'll bet you a red apple that he was in that room because you've heard about the smoke-filled rooms, and after all, that wasn't child's play. That was the real McCoy going on, and um, Prendergast was uh, cracking the whip, and I feel quite positive he was in there, although I know I had the pleasure of meeting the, the later President Harry Truman. When I left that uh, the hall uh, at the, uh, at the uh, suggestion of the guard, I went back to the hotel and bought a newspaper, Went up to my room and walked in there, and then what do you think happened when I walked into the room, Dr. Beter? The telephone was ringing, and Tom K. Smith's voice was on the other end of it. He says, Kurt, he says, Kurt, something has happened. I said, what's happened? He says, the Missouri delegation is going for Roosevelt early in the ball game. I said, nice work, Tom, old boy. And later on, he was promoted to be president of the bank. How do you like that? And of course, uh, Colonel, uh, Roosevelt went on to win the nomination. Uh, did anything happen uh, after that nomination? Well, I think a very significant thing happened on his way back. He, for some reason, instead of flying back to New York, he stopped off in Massachusetts to have a conference with Eman Del House up there and others of the, Woods, of the Woodrow Wilson regime and some of the high Democratic Party chieftains and I have a feeling that some of his most important directives were given to him at that time. He went on later on in November to win the election, you may recall. Right. Was that, uh, that's a very important point, uh, Colonel. Yes, I think so, too. Uh, did, was that at Magnolia Beach? At Magnolia Mass, as near as I can, right. as near as I can tell it. It was right. at the home of uh, E. Mandel House, who was very much in retirement. But he was still very important with the powers that be in the Democratic Party. Right. Uh, now, was Louis Howe there? Oh, yes. Very definitely. Well, uh, how do you link him up? You know, uh, President Woodrow Wilson had his Colonel E. Mandel House. Uh, how would you s compare him uh, with uh, Louis Howe as I far as capability? That's a good question. That's a very good question, Dr. Beter. I would say that E. Mandel House, who, who became the so-called alter ego of uh, President Woodrow Wilson and Louis McHenry Howe 
in, in a many ways occupied similar slots in the political machine. Both were advisors to their respective mentors, or shall I say bosses, and at the same time both of them had intimate connection with the people who put up the money for, for the Democratic Party. And FDR went on uh, to get elected, as you know, as a result of the Depression. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, Colonel, could you give us uh, the atmosphere that prevailed in the country uh, during that time? You know, at the present time, we're hearing about uh, uh, bank failures all over the country. Uh, it seems to me that the same scenario is being repeated uh, here in America. Can you expound on the feelings at that time? Uh, Dr. Peter, I, I think your observation is a very interesting one. The scenario is about to be repeated uh, uh, in those days, of course, I knew a lot about it. And uh, I went out of my way along about um, the middle of November, noticing that Mr. Hoover was trying to get a degree of cooperation from the Democratic hierarchy to collaborate with them on some formula to save a lot of these banks that were failing. I would say up to 10,000, Dr. Beter, yes. in round figures, failed in the United States. You won't believe what I'm telling you. The Democratic hierarchy did not want to do anything with the Republican machine in Washington because they wanted the banks to fail because their financial advisors wanted to buy those banks in at the very bottom. And that was a terrible thing. And thousands of people with lost their deposits and thousands of these banks went out of business. And I couldn't get the Democratic machine to move. They wanted to wait and wait and wait and let the thing go to the rock bottom. And then in late, late March, to have the thing come back there and have FDR look like he was the white knight. Well, apparently the same scenario is being repeated today with uh, Nelson Rockefeller. That I don't know, but there are certain signs uh, that are very ominous to me on the horizon. Now we're down to March the 4th, 1933, in Washington on the inauguration day. Yeah, a cold, bleak day it was. Could you describe that day to us? Uh, oh, I can remember it very vividly. It was, and I will never forget that day, never. We started out early in the morning when everybody was a little nervous and jittery. We had to attend a religious service at, uh, at the Episcopal Church, St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington. And uh, as the complicated of cars, I was in the third car, past the hotel near the church, out on the balcony was a friend of mine named Freddie Peabody who was, had a high hat on and had been celebrating all the night before at a big party. And when he saw me in the third car there, he hollered out there from this balcony and, and, and broke the tension. He says, Kurt, what are you doing down there in that car all dressed up like Astor's horse? And I said, Freddie, be careful. You'll fall off that fire escape. Well, everybody laughed and it broke the tension. So he went in and had this church service there prior to the inauguration. And then up on the hill, FDR went up there and was duly sworn in with the Hoover family standing by there looking very, very quiet. And Hoover looked very tired. I can understand that. And then later on, they had the inaugural parade. And um, long about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I went out there with my little daughter, Sister. It was very cold, and I thought I'd like to see the cavalry go by, as I was always interested in cavalry. And um, I approached the inauguration stand, and much to my surprise, I might even say dismay, there was nobody there from the White House with General Douglas MacArthur who was reviewing the troops. And I thought that was a great slight to the distinguished general. Why wasn't President Roosevelt there viewing the Well, that's a good question. Parade. I think the president had a legitimate re um, reason for not being there because he had steel braces on his legs, which in that cold day would reflect the cold. And he couldn't stand up for an hour and a half. So therefore, it was my opinion that Jimmy or Johnny or Elliot or Franklin Jr., one of them should most certainly have been there to be with the general and, and fill in for their father who could not stand the cold. But I, um, I, I, as I had my daughter with me, I watched it for, to the conclusion of the parade, and then I went back to the White House and... Um, went up to the room. I had the yellow room at that time. That was the first room on the left as you go up the stairs. And a very amusing thing happened. If you want to hear about that, I'd be glad to tell you. Uh, what went on there? 
Well, you will recall that they generally had a famous tea in the White House at 4 o'clock. And people from all over the country, particularly ladies, come from long distance to attend the tea party. Well, when I went in there about half past 3, it was a very cold day, as I say, and, uh, and a friend of mine who was the head of the international business machine company, Tom Watson. Tom Watson had given me a case of Hagen Hag pinched scotch whiskey. And I said, well, Mr. Watson, I have no political influence. But he said, oh, well, you're a nice fellow. You might as well have that. Well, everybody in the White House knew that I'd had this package because it had to be opened on account of everybody had to open up package. So everybody knew I had some some uh, hair tonic upstairs there in that yellow room. Pretty soon my friends dropped in and then I had friends of friends and pretty soon friends of friends of friends dropped in and pretty soon I had 78 people in that yellow room. And everybody was having a good time. I started out with asking for six glasses and I ended up with a whole lot more. And when the party was really going strong, about 10 after four, I got a note from the, uh, the White House usher, who was a very tall, distinguished man, a note was on this silver tray, and I opened it and read it. And it read as follows, and I wish I'd kept it. It's wonderful, wonderful souvenir. Dear Kurt, will you please stop dispensing largesse? I cannot start the White House tea, signed Eleanor Roosevelt. So, therefore, tea emerged victorious. I see. Well, <laughs> it's a very beautiful picture you painted there, Colonel. But what was Tom Watson doing there? Well, I don't know. He's a very important businessman, and you know they were going to close the banks, and I got some private information that they were going to shut the banks, and I told him that. Oh, he said, my Godfrey, Curtis, he says, I've got a big bill over at the uh, Mayfair Hotel. He says, I've got to go over there and get $500. Are you sure the banks are going to be closed? Now, yes, Mr. Watson, that's what I've been told. He says, thanks very much. I go over there and pay my bill, and I need $500. I said, well, Mr. Watson, you better go ahead and do it in a hurry. He says, I'm going to do it. Thank you very much, Curtis. Well, that was very important uh, information, Colonel. How did you come by that information? Well, I was told that the banks were going to be closed by inside people there in the White House. That was the program there. They're going to close the banks for two or three days and they'll shuffle things around. In the meantime, the insiders can line up and buy some of the uh, assets at a very cheap price in some of these closed banks. Now, in 1934, we uh, had the Congress ratify uh, President Roosevelt's uh, executive orders whereby he pegged the gold at $35 an ounce and also confirmed the uh, illegal nationalization, if you please, of the people's property, that is gold, uh, in 1933. Uh, can you tell us uh, what the uh, atmosphere was uh, around the uh, signing uh, or the passing of the gold bill in January 1934? At that time, Dr. Beter, I was fairly naive with the political background there, but some of my more well-informed friends were furious and dismayed at Roosevelt's apparent perfectly in respect to the people of the United States to withdraw their gold, which he didn't have a right to do, and then turn that gold, so I am told, over to the Federal Reserve Bank without a receipt. Now, the Louis T. McFadden knows a lot about that, and anybody who wants to know more about it can, can look up and see what he had to say about that deal. I have looked it up, Colonel. Uh, in January 1934, the gold bill was passed. Uh, Congressman Lewis T. McFadden, uh, who was chairman of the Banking and Currency Committee for 22 years, uh, made a tremendous speech, uh, and it was printed in the Congressional Record January 24, uh, 1934. It was on the Gold Reserve Act of 1934, and I want to read some portion of it because I believe it's very pertinent at this point. I think it's very pertinent, too. Please do, Dr. Beter. I want to quote from uh, Congressman McFadden at this point. Quote, You see, Mr. Chairman, under this bill, uh, the United States Treasury has to pay for the gold. Although the gold belongs to the people and was taken away from their bank deposits and their cash registers and their pocketbooks in the first place and put into the Federal Reserve banks 
And although the Federal Reserve banks tricked and fooled the people into giving it to them for the Federal Reserve currency, which they now refuse to redeem, and although that gold does not belong to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, the United States Treasury has to pay the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks for it. Well, how does this bill propose to pay the Federal Reserve outfit? How does this bill provide that the government shall take over the stolen goods? It provides that the United States Government shall give the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks new gold certificates to the full value of the loot. The gold certificates will give the Federal Reserve Banks and the Federal Reserve Board legal title to this gold. That's and incredible, the, Dr. Breeder. That's incredible. This is absolutely the way it reads. The legal title to this gold. And the United States Treasury will be nothing more than its physical custodian. The Secretary of the Treasury, who was Henry Morkenthal, Jr. at that time, will give the Federal Reserve Banks gold for their new gold certificates whenever they ask for it. It is a fraudulent transfer. And I continue, when the individual citizens of the United States were required to surrender their gold, they were required to surrender their gold certificates as well as their gold coin and bullion. The Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks are private corporations, but they did not obey the gold orders. They did not surrender any gold coin, gold certificates, or gold bullion. On the contrary, the gold which was commandeered from the people was given to them as a free gift. And now, after they have taken into their possession all the gold belonging to the people, they are ready to make a pretended transfer of that gold to the government. Evidently, there is a law for the common man and no law for the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks." Unquote. Dr. Beta, how, how in the world can the Treasury Department gave the people's gold to the Federal Reserve Bank. It was all done illegally years ago, and as I have brought out recently in my audio tapes and audio books, this gold has now been transferred to the manipulators abroad. Uh, do you feel that there was a plan as far back as uh, 1943 and even as far back as 1933? Uh, to take the gold out of Fort Knox? Would you put that past your uh, father-in-law? Well, Dr. Beter, I think it was obvious to anybody to see the efforts of the financial powers that be to reduce the, the gold standard back of the Federal Reserve notes from 40 percent, first to, then down to 25, and then lower. And uh, then uh, the uh, on the face of the bills, why there was a, a reduction of uh, um, the redeemability of those bills uh, progressively. And it was obvious to me that the reason that that was taking place, and this was long before I had the pleasure of reading some of your very interesting comments recently in the last year on the Fort Knox situation specifically, it was obvious to me that there was not the gold reserve in Fort Knox that the uh, Treasury Department purported because the uh, redeemability feature was being consecutively reduced. And the question is why? Why were they doing that? Because the gold wasn't there. I mean, it was just as simple as that. Anybody was reasonably informed on money, and I am. Well, the intelligence community has informed me on many occasions uh, that the gold is gone, that our figures, our balance sheets of the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, are fictitious. Uh, what I want to ask you, Colonel, is was the atmosphere so deceitful that they could plan the, uh, the taking away of the gold? Well, I think the atmosphere was very deceitful, Dr. Beta, way back there, and uh, it, it disturbed me a great deal at the time. Not that I knew uh, many of the specific details, but the, the atmosphere was a program 
to change our way of life in this country, and that included, I think, a dilution of the gold reserve behind our dollar at that time. Now, obviously, uh, FDR didn't dream that up. Somebody told him to do that. And who told him to do that? My guess is that the, the important uh, hierarchy of the international money boys in New York told him to do that to Henry Morgantown, Harry Dexter White, his assistant. Uh, Harry Dexter White, did you know anything about him? Yes, I know some things about him. Uh, he was put in there to hold up Henry Morgenthau, Jr., the Secretary of the Treasury, because Henry's knowledge of finance was very superficial, as his father often commented. Uh, Harry Dexter White was the very erudite, very smart operator that was close to the international boys who told Henry what to do. And he was charged with activities which bordered treason. And before he was supposed to appear before the Senate to answer these charges, he had a heart attack, according to the newspapers, and purportedly died. Some people doubt that. So those people who did hold gold and did not turn it in, because under the Federal uh, Gold Reserve Act of 1934, those people who had the gold outside uh, the continental United States or in the Philippines, they could bring their gold back and get $35 an ounce, while the peasants, that is us, uh, who turned in our gold, we only got $20 an ounce. Now, they made a whopping uh, profit there. So why, couldn't That's they, right. so why couldn't they continue making enormous profits at the expense of the American people? Well, I think that's a very plausible suggestion. If the government is corrupt, our money will be corrupt. That's right. That's right. This brings me back to something that you told me earlier about the fact that Henry Morgenthau, Jr. was told to come down here and perform a service. In other words, he was uh, supposed to come down here and follow orders. Whose orders, Colonel Dow? I'm asking you now for the record, whose orders do you think Henry Morgenthau, Jr. was following? I think he very definitely followed the orders from the hierarchy of the New York International Bankers, Dr. Beter, and I think he admitted that very open-mindedly, as Henry Morgan now really didn't know what was going on. And here we have a man who was our Secretary of Treasury. Well, he was put in there for that specific purpose. But and he was, was just a puppet. And this was during the most perilous days of our republic? One of our most perilous days. We're in perilous days today. The, may I ask this? Do you believe that the Treasury Department is still in the clutches of these same people who then were able to take away the people's gold and now have it within, have it within their own pockets? I think the situation is a very similar one, Dr. Beter. So times have not changed. I don't think they've changed a bit. In fact, I think they may have worsened. <laughs>